I thought tonight it would bless you if I showed you the life of a man of God and how unpredictable those men sometimes are. It seems like every time, you know, you get with people and they want to put you in this mold or in that mold, and when a man's really walking for God, it is very, very difficult to find a pigeonhole to put him into. Because about the time you put him in that hole where the pigeon ought to be, he flips out and gets over in that hole. And there's a record in Acts 16 that has always blessed my heart, has always thrilled me. And I stand in utter amazement again of it. And I'm real thankful to God that it's in the Word because it keeps refreshing my heart and my life. And I'd like for it to do the same for you. Chapter 16 of verse 1. Then came he, Paul, to Derbe and Lystra. Now that Derby is not Kentucky. That's in the old Asia Minor area. And it is the furthest most, it's the furthest eastern point of that Lyconia area of Galatia that they that he passed into. And it's about sixty miles from the city of Lystra. Uh, if you want to know a great deal about the city of Derby and Lystra, you're just going to have to get a dictionary of the Bible and take a look at it and see these cities. Uh, by the way, you should have a map. Look at the in the back of your Bible. Most of the Bibles have a map of Paul's missionary journeys or the journeys of St. Paul, he says sometimes. Way in the back of the Bible, about the last thing there. Our, our map. Do you now look for the missionary journeys of Paul or the journeys of Saint Paul? Those are usually the words that are written on the map. Did you find it? Okay. Do you see the city of Derby, of Derba, and Lystra? Right. You know, you got Cilicia, you got Pamphylia, you got Galatia, and then Lyconia right in between. It's right at the northern tip there of the Mediterranean. If you go over a little further east and come down, you have Antioch, and then in Syria, see, where the people were first called Christians. Now back to Acts 16. Came to Durban, Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there. Named Timethus. Timethus is a Greek word. The English translation is Timothy. Why they didn't put Timothy in here, you must ask the King James boys. But that's his name, Timothy. The son of a woman which was a Jewess. The word certain is scratched. No text has it. the son of a woman which was a Jewess, who believed, who believed. His father was a Greek or a Gentile, an unbeliever, was sort of a mixed marriage. Verse 2, who was well reported of, that is Timothy, well reported of, by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. In other words, this young disciple, Timothy, was well reported of. The people liked him in the fellowship. When it talks about being well reported of, it says by the brethren. The people in the community don't always well report of you. The unbelievers don't always particularly enjoy a believer, and they may not give the believer a good report. So you never go to the unbeliever. You go to the believers to find out what kind of a man or a woman that individual is. And he was well reported of, highly esteemed, a wonderful young man with great dedication, great ability, great commitment. That's what they reported, both at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go with him? 
Paul took him along for a number of reasons. Number one, to help him carry his suitcase, maybe lay out his ties and shirts, and take care of Bigfoot, and <laughs> do something like that. But secondly, I believe that he could share with him his life and his teaching of the Word and bless Timothy. I know no better way to communicate to people than to live with them, to share your heart and life with them. That's one of the reasons I spend as much time as I can with the core and the core with me so that we live with each other, we see each other, we, you know, I sometimes use the phrase, you see me when I'm good and you see me when I'm bad. You see me when I'm happy and when I'm angry. Uh, not that maybe it's literally true, I don't know, I haven't thought about it, but it simply means we're with each other. And I always enjoy going to the woods and sleeping out with the core. Take our sleeping bags, spend a night sleeping with them. And I can always say I slept with the core. See? And the core can say they slept with me. Keeps it interesting <laughs> and exciting. But you see, it gets you with people. One of the reasons you enjoy coming to international so much is because it gets you close to people. Real close. And, you know, sometimes I'm grateful when we have 10, 15,000 people, but I'm also grateful when I have six or seven in a little twig or something. You get close to people. Timothy went with Paul, and Paul wanted him to go along. First of all, he had some quality. I can't imagine Paul taking a ninja poop with him, somebody that always rub his fur the wrong way, someone who would always you know, be tripping over his own feet or something. But he took with him a man of whom the report was among the believers that he was a wonderful young man. Even though his mother, his father was not a believer, his mother was. That didn't stop Paul from taking him. Secondly, it says him, in verse 3, Paul took and he did the unforgivable thing. He circumcised him. That is what just blows my mind. The great apostle Paul, who takes such a crack at the law and legalism, who takes such a crack at circumcision and everything else, turns right around, contradicts himself, and does the very thing he says shouldn't be done. He had him circumcised. And he says, because the Jews were in those quarters, for they, they knew all. They, uh, everyone knew that his father was a Greek, a Gentile, an unbeliever. He took him, Paul took Timothy, and he had him circumcised. Take a look at Galatians. Keep your finger in Acts. I'll show you how this thing really is exciting. Galatians, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. Chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us what? And be not entangled. The word entangled means literally no longer held in by. Entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage is the law. The Old Testament law. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you what? <laughs> Same fellow. Here in Galatians, he says, stand fast in the liberty. Don't get yourself circumcised. Don't get under that old yoke of bondage. Today, it's not so much circumcision. Today, it's water, baptism. Still fighting about it. I just heard last week that one of the reasons a certain couple in one of the countries 
had turned against my ministry and our ministry was because I did not believe in water baptism. Well, that's true. I don't. No problem. I think it's much more important to have Christ in you and be baptized with the presence of Christ in you than all the water in the Atlantic or the Jordan or the Pacific. You can clean the outside of the body with water, but what about inside? And the baptism of the Christ in you, the hope of glory, as it says in the Word, is fantastically bigger than all the sprinkling, dipping, immersion, dry cleaning, anything else you like. Well, he said, I say, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you what? And yet he had turned right around, and who did he have circumcised? He circumcised him. Read something. That's why I say, when you've got a real man of God walking with God, it's, it's, just, it's just almost impossible to explain his life. I never try to explain it. I just believe God's word. I don't go around explaining it. He's just a man walking by the Spirit of God. And when that man does that, he sometimes has to break with something that he previously said because the situation is different. I'll show you from the Word why Paul did that, why that man of God was like that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 9, verse 22, 18. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I make the gospel without charge. That doesn't mean without CIF money and all that stuff. That I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all, Yet have I made myself servant unto what? That I might gain the more. In other words, that I might win the people. Unto the Jews I became as they what? That I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the what? That I might gain them that are under the what? To them that are without law as without law being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without, that's Gentile. Here's the great 22nd verse. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for what? The gospel's sake. That I do for the gospel's sake. See, I keep teaching my people in the core, and wherever I teach, usually it comes up. There are some things that you can do in your private life, in your own home, in your own bedroom. Maybe you can't do out when you're with the believers or with people. Paul knew that circumcision was totally unnecessary. Cutting off the foreskin doesn't make you a better Christian. He knew that. He knew that, but boy, if it became necessary to motivate people and to take a stand, he'd just have old Timothy circumcised. That's why he did it. Look at chapter 10 of Corinthians. Even verse 33, as I please all in all, not seeking my own what? Profit. You see, you can become so self-righteous, so adamant, so dynamically sure of your biblical position that if anybody goes against the position, you cut them down. He didn't do that. Paul didn't do that. He looked for the prophet. The prophet. Boy, that's it. And if you have to change in order to meet people's needs, you look at the prophet. You don't become so dogmatically set upon the word that you can't 
change within the word as long as it's not sin. If it's sin, it should be out. You know that. But I have immersed people, and you wouldn't believe it if I didn't personally tell you. That's right. I've done it. Now, I felt like a fool doing it, but I did it anyway. I imagine Paul felt like a fool to have to take old Timothy, knowing what he knew about the love and the grace of God and what he had already said, that if you get circumcised like falling out of grace, turn right around, circumcise the young boy or something, young man. That's something. I'm glad not too many people ask me to immerse them anymore. But, uh, you know, I suppose if it ever came up and somebody really felt they want to get immersed, if that's what it gets you saved, I'd do it. I've told you already, if I could get you saved by learning to stand on my head, walk backwards, wiggle my ears doing it, I'd do anything just to get people saved, as long as it is not sin. The prophet of circumcision, as far as God is concerned, didn't amount to a thing. But as far as the Jews in that area, as far as the father and the mother were concerned, this was a fantastic thing that Paul did. That's why I said, you just cannot pigeonhole men, but if you look at the greatness and you study the prophet in it, where that man of God like Paul, he, he was not concerned about himself, he was concerned about serving people. And to serve people, it's just something. Become all things to all men. Where is that scripture? There's a, a he, he says someplace that w w with those who cried, he cried with. With those who rejoiced, he rejoiced with. With those who prayed, he prayed with. That's the walk of a man of God. Like Paul, it was tremendous. Well, that's the reason he circumcised him. Verse 4. I'm back in Acts 16. And as they went, Timothy and Paul, through the cities, they went from one city to another, like a day in the Word or something, maybe a weekend, I don't know. They went through the cities, they delivered them the decree. The word decree is the word dogma. They delivered to them the decrees, the dogma, for to keep that were ordained, decided of the apostles and the elders, which were where? See, Paul carried a message. Not only the teaching of the word, but the teaching or the, the decrees that the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem had sent along with him. He carried that message to the people. Really something. Wherever the Spirit of God moves and men and women are born again of God's Spirit, there has to be a coordination. There has to be some type of decree, some type of system, you understand? Not an abundance, but enough to keep the thing moving the right direction. It's like if you go hunting for squirrel, you can't aim your shotgun all over every tree if the squirrel's up in one tree. You want to get him, you better stay up in that tree. Get yourself right on him. One of the, one of the temptations that men of God go through and is to, instead of staying free within the general framework, they begin to add more and more and more and more decrees and dogmas. And if you will check through the history of Christianity, you will find that most so-called institutions or organizations have so many decrees that hardly anybody, unless you just want to be a 
totally, I'm totally, totally foul without really thinking, could he really belong to it? You know, they got you so straight jacketed that you can hardly move at times. That's the other side of it. The other side, again, is if there is no structure, then people just run helter-skelter shooting all over the place. The thing I see in the Word, and I can pattern this in the life of Paul and other men of God as I go through the Word, they worked within a framework, but they were free within that framework to change if the need arose. And in my mind, I've done my best through these years to pattern the way ministry along that line. We have a framework, but we are free within that framework if it's right on. And if it would do the job, the profit. But some of you people know that I had to take a fantastic stand recently, and I took it, and I'll keep standing there. That's the position of the way ministry. This is a position of the board of directors, the board of trustees, that we do not advocate smoking dope. And that if anybody wants to smoke dope, I guess they're free to smoke dope, like you're free to die if you want to. You're free to shoot yourself if you're in the way ministry if you want to. You're free to get drunk if you want to. Think you're stupid, but you're free. You got freedom of will, right? But the position of the way ministry is that we have no leadership in the ministry at any time who smokes dope. And I had to take a stand, and I took a stand, and I stand there tonight. That's the general pattern. You have a lot of freedom. Nor would I allow a man leadership in the way ministry if he goes out and gets drunk. You don't need that kind of leadership. That's like the decree, the dogma that was sent out from the apostles and the believers, the elders at Jerusalem. It's a framework. And I told you that as long as it's not sin, there's a tremendous freedom. I think smoking dope is sin. I believe getting drunk is sin. That ought to be plain enough. What's the position of our ministry? That's our position. Now, if people don't want to fit within that, that's their freedom. But then they're not part of the ministry that we in the way represent. So that's why I understand these decrees, the dogmas that were sent out by the apostles and the elders. And the first century church really got blessed because they stuck by that stuff. It was only after they began to lose the mystery. And that again, I understand because it's written in the word in Timothy, how they forsook Paul. They didn't forsake Paul because of the way he combed his hair or the shoes he wore, the manner of dress, but because the adversary, the devil, tricked people and they forsook the teaching of the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Gentiles, fellow heirs, and of the same body. They forsook the mystery. And it's after that, if you'll check your history, it's after that that they started to build the church at Ephesus building. The Babylon, the church in Babylon, the church in Edith, Edessa, that's when they started building the building. And we never got out of it all through the Europe. You see the big cathedrals, all through the Roman Catholic system. You see the cathedrals, all through Protestantism. And so we lost the life, the vital, dynamic life of the Word. Because They just squashed it in. This is why I understand Paul circumcising this man. I understand his delivery of the decree wherever they went. They said, people, this is the way it works. 
and it did. That's why verse 5 is so electrifying. And so were the churches. The churches. The body of believers. And if you read the book of Acts, the churches were in the home. They were twigs. They met in the home. And when there wasn't enough room in the home, they go outside. And if it was nice weather, sometime to go outside anyway. Go to the river. Go to the lake. Well, it tells you that in this chapter. They went to the river. Uh, someplace in here, I forget, same, same chapter. Um, what, what verse? 13? Yeah. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by riverside. <laughs> Told you. That's the early church, sir. They met in the homes. That's where they had their twig. That was the church. Today, when we think of a church, you know, we think of four million members. That's the church. The church is wherever there are two or three gathered together in his name, born again of God's spirit. That's the church. So the churches, verse 5, so were the churches established. You know what the word established means? Rooted, grounded, settled in. People, you don't get settled in the first night you're born again of God's Spirit. You don't get settled in the first night you start in a class on power for abundant living. Matter of fact, you don't even hardly ever get settled in even after you finish the class until you begin to renew your mind on it. You go over it again and you just get deeper and deeper and deeper in your settling in on the Word. Take time. So were the churches established, settled in, rooted. How were they rooted? Well, they delivered the decrees, the things that were established and by the elders and the apostles. They delivered those, and the people walked in the light of that general framework, and the churches were established, established, got solid in the faith, solid in the faith. The faith which came by the Lord Jesus Christ, solid in that. And the what? Increased. Increased. What increased? The churches. Context. The churches increased what? Daily. Craig Martindale has this section down to a science. Me, I just flip around. He worked that thing. You see, in the early part, it, asks, it says, and the Lord added to the church daily. The Lord added to the church daily, such as we're being what? Saved. Here it doesn't say the Lord added to the church daily. It says that the churches were increased daily. The churches were increased. How? Wouldn't you love to live to see this again? Wouldn't you like to see this happen in your community, our community this week? That the churches were increased. What? I know that takes more than two to have a church. You know, twiggy. The churches, boy, isn't that electrifying? Isn't even the thought concept electrifying? They did it then with the same God, same word of God as you and I have today. The churches increase daily. Is that what it says? That's what it means. Man, that means somebody was out there witnessing. Somebody was out there holding forth God's word. They were not sitting home watching the boob tube or something and reading the late newspaper arguing about this. 
They were out moving the word. I looked at that great newspaper out of England. Good Lord, anybody read that never would get to the word all week. The world is still trying just desperately to get people away from the word. They just do everything and anything to keep people from the word. And if you salam them and you give in to them, you never get to the word. Why not try the word? The world hasn't worked its method successfully in making a better world, getting people blessed and happy by all the newsprint, by all the radio, by all the television. Now that's what's in my heart when I say to the people in the class on Power for Abundant Living, put some of that stuff away. Well, I think three months or something, I forget what I say. Well, I say is the truth. And just read the word every spare moment. Build the word. Look, they were established. You're not going to get established by spending one hour reading the newspaper, one hour watching television, and one minute reading the word. You got the wrong diet. <laughs> Look, we've had everything given to us in the world like that for years. Why not just take a break from it and go to the Word? Why not just try the Word once for three months? Put your heart and mind into the Word every chance you get to read it. Every chance you get to be in a believer's fellowship, be there. Every chance you get to pray in a believer's fellowship, pray. Every chance you get to speak in tongues and interpret in that twig fellowship, do it and see how much you'll grow. A lot of our people have done this. They grew like crazy. And then they got to the same place that many times alcoholics get to. They say, well, I got it conquered. Now I can drink again. You're crazy if you're an alcoholic. Once you're an alcoholic and you get off of it, you just better never touch a drop again. If you do, you're gone down the skid. People in the Word are like this. Once you've really tapped the greatness of the Word, and then you think, well, now I can run back to the old flesh spots of Egypt or someplace. I can get involved again in the old machinery. I can sit and watch the late shows till 3 in the morning. I can listen to all the negatives. won't bother me. Well, I want to tell you something. You're not going to stand for God and his word. You're going to cop out. You're going to sell out. You're not going to stay faithful on the word. It just doesn't work that way. The churches were established in the lot. Faith and the churches increased in number. How? That's verse 5. Well, verse 6. Now, when they had gone through throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, huh? after they were come to Mycenae, they tried, the word of state is the word tried, to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. In other words, didn't allow them to go. That is interesting. Where did they want to go? Well, he wanted to go in the region of Galatia. He wanted to go uh, into Bithynia. But the Lord closed the door. Told him not to go. Why not? God knows what is best, doesn't he? And if men will listen, that's the way God walks and talks with men and women. I've had an invitation to go to Russia and teach the class on Power for Abundant Living since 1900 and, oh, good Lord, Mother, when, what year was that? Is she still here? When were we in India? I forget. Good gravy. Century ago. I forget. Ever since we were there that time, the fellow that's the head of the Roman, of the all the churches so-called in Russia, 
the Archbishop. That's not it. I forget his name. I've had an invitation. Want me to go to Rush and teach? Invited, at least. I don't. I haven't had one since that, so I don't know if that's still standing. But you know, to me, one invitation. If I invite you to my house, it stands until you get there. Okay. So if he was that honest, it's still available. At the time it was given, I was definitely told not to go. I'd love to go to Rush and teach the word. Because the same word of God would do the same thing there if people believed. But the door never opened. Furthermore, he told me if I went, I'd get killed and I didn't want to die, so I stayed home. But <laughs> uh, you see, to me, I understand God's walking with Paul here. Because this is the way God works with his people. Boy, this is just beautiful. He wanted to go one place, God said no deal. Want to go another place, God said no deal. And then one evening, he had a vision. <laughs> and full color, spiritual TV. Appeared to Paul in the night. And here is what he saw. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him. To pray is to lovingly beg and request saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. In verse 10, and after he had seen the vision, 11.30 in the evening, immediately, you know what immediately means? Immediately. We, we, this is Luke, Timothy, and himself. Immediately, we endeavored to go into, Massimo, into Macedonia, being assured, assuredly gathering, being absolutely certain that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel under them. Isn't that something? The word of God was the will of God to this man. Even if he got it by revelation of a vision, the vision, of course, is seeing it. Either see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, or touch it. The revelation. He saw it. God showed him a picture. The man of Macedonia standing up and say, come on over, Paul, come on over. Bring Luke and Tim with you. Come on, Paul, we need to hear the gospel. Was that nice? Paul was doing his horizontal hour or something, sleep. But immediately, immediately, immediately after the vision, he got up and he started packing. That's what you call moving on God's word. That's action, that's believing. A man will read God's word and he'll say, well, I'll think about that a while. You know, it's written, it's written. I would y'all speak in tongues, but I want to speak in tongues. Well, shut up, it's still written. If you don't want to, shut up, don't even talk about it. You see, why the word of God is the will of God? <laughs> Good backup. <laughs> Immediately. Boy, when you begin to see the action of that man of God, then you see why a man of God has to move out at the moment. You know, we wanted Randy Misek so badly back in Taiwan after he graduated from the Corps, the Sixth Corps. Remember that? Boy, we had everything planned. All the doors seemed to be open. And we just wanted him back in Taiwan so badly because I want to get in China. I want to see the word move in China. They need it. They are like we do in the United States. But I think the whole world needs the word. One night he called up, just called, and, you know, the people who had promised him or something that they'd give him a job and that they'd do this in that country so he could get in had reneged. They didn't do it. And he needed, I think, $500 or something to get it 
and he wanted to know if we would give him the 500 to get over there. And I said, nope, we don't go. You know, and Randy knows I love him, and he loves me. We love each other, but we both love God. The reason I couldn't do it, because the moment he called Father, he said, door closed. I understand that language. And I've learned that when the door closes, you don't give it a kick to open it. When the Lord opens the door, it swings on its own hinges. And then all you do is walk through. If you push it open, you know, with your foot, by the time you get through it, it'll most likely start hitting you in the nose. So uh, don't ask me why it's closed. I don't know that answer. All I know, it was closed. Don't ask me why this region of Galatia was closed. Bethania was closed. I don't know why. All I know, it was closed. That's all. And I don't think you're going to be any smarter than I am because there's no other place that tells you in the Word of God why they were closed. So I don't think you're going to know more about it than I know tonight because there's just no other place. It's just closed. When the time comes, and it's right, and if Father wants Randall over there, that door is again going to what? And we just walk in. Just walk in. I pray a lot like this in my life, that if God wants me to do so and so, that it be the door be open, that I can just easily walk in. Because it cannot be strained, for all strain is drain, and you don't want to drain yourself. You want to move God's word. And therefore, I just pray that the doors have to be open. I think this is such a beautiful teaching in, of God's word in here, of the greatness of the walk, not only of men of God, but of, you know, with ministries like Paul had, but the believers, every believer, every born-again Christian believer. Well, immediately he got packed up and left. <laughs> they came from Troas with a straight course. Mind you, they didn't stop off for a holiday in Florida or in California. Didn't go to the White Mountains in Vermont in summer. From thence to Philippi, which is the chief city, verse 12, the most important city in that part of Macedonia. And they were there abiding certain days. What do you think they were doing those certain days? Most likely talking about it, but nothing was happening. <laughs> Have you ever gone witnessing with no response? That's what they were doing. They were there certain days, nothing happened. But they were still standing faithful. But there came a Sabbath, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went out of the gate, that's the gate of the city, to a riverside where prayer was accustomed to be made, where people, a group of people went to pray. And we sat down and spake unto the women, oh, no, oh, no, hey, the vision. The vision. The vision was what? A man. Uh -huh. Really something. When he gets there, he finds none but women. Not bad, but sort of. You got opportunities. You have to work the word to get the understanding. And it's really remarkable. The man was calling. That's the vision. But when he got there, he found out it wasn't a man, that the, the thing that had happened over here was a woman. The women were gathered together. And they sat down and they spoke to the women, which is sort of out of culture. You just don't sit down in the Bible lands and start rapping with a woman. You get a knife up your back. 
that it's all it's just not culture to do it well it's a great chapter we have a little circumcision <laughs> now we have a fellow that wants to go in god says no deal close the door now we have a fellow gets a vision to go uh, to a man in macedonia women quite a chapter They spoke to the women. Really wonderful. Breaking the culture. You see, earlier I talked to you about prophets walking by revelation, just going, doing that which is right, as long as it's not what? Sin. Sin is broken fellowship. He's not breaking any fellowship talking to women. He's just breaking a few customs, you know. Thou shalt not walk on Sunday. He quit. See? Breaking a few of the customs, that's all. And he didn't go there and dog everybody and say, from now on, I'm only going to talk to women. See? No, no, no. He just walked, people. And he resorted thither, sat down, and spoke to them. And a certain woman named Lydia, my sister's name, a seller of purple of the city of Tyra, which was a very influential city, made the finest dyes, dyes that always say dyed. They didn't rinse out. Whose heart the what? Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of or by Paul. Paul spoke the word, but who opened the heart? God always opened the heart, honey, by the word. The word. The word. So wherever you go speaking to people, you get around to what? The word. If you ever expect to have their hearts open. It's the word. Remember on the road to Emmaus? On that Easter Sunday when our Lord and Savior joined himself to those two men? They reported later on back in Jerusalem, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened us the word? That's what happened to this beautiful woman named Lydia. Paul spoke the word. The Lord opens people's hearts through the word. And when she was baptized in water, doesn't say that does it now in verse 15 well by the same logic that you would dare to put water in you got to be as honest with me that i must have the same right to leave it up if you just want sheer logic now if you really want sheer sheer logic <laughs> i'd take you back to acts 2 show you what it is to be have christ in you to be baptized with his presence and then I put the screws on you in verse 15 to show you that by sheer, sheer, sheer logic, we're more accurate saying it was not water than anybody who says water for verse 15. Well, you have it whichever way you like, just walk the way of the word, okay? When she was baptized, and now her what? Wow, whoa, 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 whoa. What happened from the time they gathered at the river, Paul began speaking the word, to where her whole household got born again, and all of them were baptized. Maybe it took him till 10 o'clock that night. She must have gone back, perhaps, got her husband, got her son, daughters, all the rest of them, brought them all over. Quite a woman, Lydia. And that starts a fantastic work in that section of the world. And she besought, in verse 15, us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide. And she constrained him. <laughs> Gave him three reasons why I ought to do it. That's constraining. First two, you always renege. Third one, you accept. In the United States, you always accept the first one, you know. 
come to my house for dinner. When? <laughs> In the Bible, the constraint is an Orientalism, and you always had three excuses why you couldn't come. You know, I just ate lunch. If you haven't had lunch since yesterday, that means you just ate it yesterday. Uh, or I have to go so and so. Fine. Third one, you say, well, since you're twisting my arm, uh, I'll really come with you. Constrain him. Well, people, that's the word for tonight. And trust that blessed is a great chapter. And there's just tremendous light in there on the walk of a man of God in so many different ways that it's almost worth a dissertation. <laughs>